is the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, without her, I don't know where I would be. You don't see a lot of trans athletes in sports, so it's kind of a way for me to show that community in a different light. I have no other choice but to keep on voicing my opinion and keep on fighting for the better treatment of black and brown people in this country. Welcome to Stitch, where we recognize the feel good, do good, and all around good stories from across the country. I'm Allie Ross. Today, we are sharing stories of inspiring athletes from coast to coast. You'll hear moving stories of Paralympic athletes, athletes trailblazing paths, and sports stars who are using their platform to affect change. Here's Devontae McKenneth with our first story of a member of Team USA who isn't letting the pandemic stop her preparations for the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Oksana Masters is a multi-medalist, Paralympic skier, and cyclist who's been training for the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Oksana was born in Ukraine, where both her legs were damaged by radiation poisoning from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Both of her legs had to be amputated by the time she turned 13. In 2020, her Paralympic prep took her right to Oklahoma. I'm so excited to be here in Oklahoma City. I've never been to Oklahoma. The reason I'm here is to get some upgrades to my better half. And that's where Scott Sabalich Prosthetics comes in. We're building basically four legs in two weeks. Uh, a set of everyday legs and a set of running legs. I had a set of running legs, but they weren't mine. They were my teammates and they were meant for a man and they never really fit for me in my sockets. I couldn't run in them. She started her Paralympic journey when she was just 13 years old as an adaptive rower. Her new prosthetics have her thinking about getting her hand into a new sport. My goal now, I think we were talking about it earlier, is maybe some track and field, short sprints, but long jump, because yeah. I am a klutz. For the very first time, she'll have legs made just for her. I think the biggest difference is I feel safer and I'm able, instead of walking backwards down a hill, I can finally walk normal down a hill like I always have. And yes, we're looking forward to Oksana adding yet another sport to her roster. Up next, we'll take a look at a story of a gymnast whose personal battle with a rare condition inspired her to start an organization to help fellow amputees across the country. Everything was going to be different in my life, but different didn't mean bad and different didn't mean incapable. It just meant that I needed to do things in a way that was new and innovative. I'm Tina Hurley, and I'm the owner and founder of a nonprofit called Less Leg More Heart. I was realizing in every aspect of my life, my legs started to limit me. The gym was the first place it manifested, and then it was harder to walk my dog around one block. The best way to describe it is you feel like you have, you're dragging cinder blocks. So I go see one of the consultants, a vascular surgeon, and he couldn't find pulses from my knees down when my calves were engaged through lots and lots of diagnostic testing, very invasive procedures. Uh, I was diagnosed with popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. So it's in both of my legs, and the only way to solve my condition is to amputate above both of the knees. That would get rid of everything. So I had to amputate my leg three times higher and higher after 10 failed surgeries, so 13 surgeries in total in less than three years. Less than six weeks after a big revision of my amputation, um, I came home and I found all my husband's things were gone. And that was like the moment where the last little bit of carpet that was underneath the one leg I had remaining was just ripped. I mean, it was just leveling. The depression was leveling. There were so many holes in care, you know, things that insurance didn't cover, things that were holistic that weren't covered, that were the real strains on my life emotionally and also on my support systems. Then I realized that sitting in my home all day in that house of memories was killing me. What has always lifted me, and by default that I said, I need community and physicality. Not everything bad that happens has to stay bad. Remember that you have a place and that you have value, and serve that forward as, as best you can. Might be a really good place to, um, to go. Yeah, well, when you think about the effect of some kind of longer term partnership if we were to get a contact over there at the amputation right. center and then some of the care packages that we have like tons of goods for. And so less like more heart just, you know, I was seeing in my head less like more all these words and then settles into heart. It just was so compelling for me. A less like more heart is a charity that's dedicated to helping 
anyone with a permanent physical impairment. Anything that either is congenital, meaning they're born with it, or is a new acquired disability. What we're trying to do is take the burden off of these folks emotionally and physically so they can deal with the new set of circumstances and navigate what is a really rocky terrain. I'm a physiologist and a physician assistant. In nowhere in my studies had I been taught what you do when you don't have an appendage. You walk around the sun 32 years with something and then all of a sudden you wake up and the sheet's flat where your foot used to be and they're just like, go figure it out. Really, it's just go figure it out. So I have a team of folks, including myself, that will actually be at bedside with someone in hospitals, rehabs, doctor's offices, really just trying to make sure that we're a double set of eyes for them and their loved ones. I would encourage people that are not familiar with the disability population to approach first with the intention to pump them up. Someone will stop what they're doing and open-eyed stare and go, you poor thing. I don't need sympathy. I need your words of strength. Maybe not saying you're so inspirational to someone with a disability at the grocery store because they just are grocery shopping. I am going to become a mom first and then go back to being a PA next year. I am in a wonderful relationship with someone that pulls me around by my hand in my wheelchair at the end of the day when my legs hurt. We are out there living our best lives, adapting and persevering, turning our trials into triumphs, and just doing the very best we can, just like everybody else on the planet. Now to the story of a 1996 gold medalist who's finding joy in getting back into the world of sports. It's all thanks to the help of an adapted golf program at the University of Maryland Rehabilitation and Orthopedic Institute. This was great being able to get back into sports and know that I'm back, I'm really me. Larry Hughes, a Marine vet who was paralyzed back in 1967, won gold in the 1996 Paralympic Games by throwing discus. He's a very avid golfer too, who relied heavily on stand-up chairs to play. But now, thanks to the University of Maryland's adaptive sports program, he could use the pair golfer to give him the ability to play the sports that he loves. When I got up in an upright position, it blew my mind. The reason why it blew my mind was all the things that I thought were out of my mind that I couldn't do. The program has been helping people with disabilities since 1991, and the pair golfer isn't just for golf. It allows people like Larry to participate in other activities as well, like fishing and archery. They are able to concentrate more on their shots um, and the fundamentals of the game because they're not worrying about losing their balance and, and someone having to step in and maybe catch them. The university is hoping to get more pair golfer chairs to continue helping people who would like to use them. When we come back, we have more stories of inspiring athletes who are blazing trails and leaving legacies for many others to follow. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now let us introduce you to a group of trailblazers leading the way in their respective sports. First up, a transgender college soccer player whose passion for the game helped him through his transition. I was born different. I think this is the wrong body for me. I'm trans. I was born female and then, but never felt that way, never identified that way. You know, I've always been this. Being a trans athlete wasn't always easy for Ken, but now he plays goalie for Northern Vermont University's men's soccer team. But playing for the girls varsity soccer team in high school in Osable, New York, it was a challenging time to say the least for Ken. Ignorance, I guess. It was a lot of just like when I would go play sports in neighboring towns, but being in Osable was a lot more accepting than I gave people credit for. Oh, good job, Ken! Ken's plans to wait until after college to begin his hormone therapy changed after he started to come out. It's like being in middle school again. <laughs> you know, you got breakouts. It's like someone going through another puberty. It's not fun. You know, doctors mix up with hormones and lapses. But Ken has a lot of people on his side who wouldn't let him give up during his toughest moments. Just like, nope, keep going. I've told him time and time again, I really don't know what you're going through, but I know hard times are hard times. We're like, come on, Ken, you can do this. Like, we gotta get you through this. And ultimately he came out on top and here we are. Being a beacon for the trans community on the soccer field is important to Ken. You don't see a lot of trans athletes in sports. 
So it's kind of a way for me to show that community in a different light. I mean, you just gotta keep pushing. Like, it gets better. Like, it really does. But above all else, Ken loves the sport and the freedom it's provided him. I never had to think about the outside world or dealing with this internal like struggle of being trans. Like when I was playing, I just, you were on the field and it was just like complete bliss. When it comes to representation elsewhere in sports, skateboarding is one area that's been largely male dominated. But this group of skaters who don't identify as cisgender men has dropped into the skating world and they are not afraid to make their presence known. Skateboarding has been such a like white cis male sport for so long. As a mom and my younger son, in his eyes, I feel like it's inevitable that he'll skateboard. But he also is like skateboarding because I do it, not because there are other dudes who do it. He's like, oh, I want to be like my mom. There's this really great line in Clueless. Well, if girls learned how to skateboard, what would guys do to impress them? And that's kind of always stuck in my head where it's like, that's the thing that the boys that you like do. It's not the thing you do. Shred Your Fears is a skateboarding and yoga workshop for women. It's open to everyone, whether they have experience or not. It's meant to basically use skateboarding as the modality to explore their fear, push themselves out of their comfort zone. Shred Your Fears is for any non-male cis skater. So we want it to be really inclusive of anyone who identifies as a female, of trans women. We want it to be a space where people can come in and feel comfortable and learn to skateboard. So no experience is necessary. And I'm just gonna create a space that not only supports what it already is, but try to find ways to make space for people who might want to experience it and make sure they know that they are safe here, that it is for them too, they're gonna to be welcomed, and that anything that would make them uncomfortable won't be tolerated. Myself and another mom brought our kids here. I was drinking my coffee and watching them skate. Someone was like, well, you know, parents skate for free. And I was like, really? So I found some friends and I was like, let's take a group lesson. And I realized that there was this great opportunity for women to come here and participate and just really be a part of the community. But like the one kind of barrier was the learning part. Those foundational pieces of like, where do you put your feet? How do you start pushing, overcome that like initial fear that you have? When I came up with the idea, I would, you know, talk to some people. Hey, if I did this, do you think you would come? And immediately I just felt the energy of like, Yes. And she asked me if I would ever attend an event like this, and I was like, hell yeah, and I just keep coming back. Started thinking about what would be the elements that like I would want to integrate. We get to know each other at the beginning, we do yoga together, we eat brunch together, and then we skateboard together. Today there was just so much cheering that happened that I just love. Why aren't we in more situations as human beings where we're excited for one another? Because I remember the first time I did it where I'm like, this is scary, this is, oh, I, look, I just bent my knees and now I'm coasting. I think the biggest takeaway has been a few things, mainly that you can do anything. So you, ex you build the confidence or overcome, you know, the fear the day of the event and then you walk out and you take that with you. So when I think about shred your fears, I think about not being controlled by anxiety, but just like cruising past it. Shred your fears for me means seeing black women do it. I didn't grow up seeing any black people on a skateboard. So it was like, that's not for black people. It's definitely not for women. And now to see 20 plus women show up in one space just to skateboard. That says so much. And then there's diversity in the room. I think my daughter would be proud to see this stigma for what it was and how we're changing that as women, especially in our city. We're breaking down walls. Our next story follows an exceptional golfer who's made a name for herself even before her age hits double digits. I love driving and I love putting and I love golf. When it comes to golf, nine-year-old Gabby Huddleston is a natural. She started playing when she was just two years old. One, two, three. Yay! I got her the toys and she just starts swinging. Uh, I just. It was a natural swing, so I just knew that 
I could teach her more and kind of just take it from there. It was amazing how natural the swing was. She would hit the ball, not knowing anything about golf, and get so excited about it. Now, when Gabby plays, she draws a crowd. Makes me feel happy. Her daddy is happy to be her coach and her caddy, but just don't ask him to go head to head with his daughter. I don't even want to pull my golf bag out when I have to play against her. <laughs> Gabby actually finished 2020 in the top five in the U.S. Kids Golf Fall Local Tour and even qualified for the USKG World Championship. She hopes that one day she'll play in the PGA Tour. But even if plans change, her dad is just happy to be spending this time with her on the green. I know that maybe one day she might not, you know, be into it as much, which I'm fine with that, but for now, just about the memories we're making and the bond we have. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, without her, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> and when we come back, we'll have more stories of inspiring athletes making change and inspiring others through their activism. Stay with us. Welcome back. Through action comes change, and these athletes are paving the way for future generations through their activism. We'll be introducing you to some impressive wave makers in the world of sports. Even through yellow cards and penalties, a Vermont high school soccer team made national headlines for their push to address the gender pay gap. I think it just happened with us like all like believing in this movement so strongly and all of us like wanting to, like we wanted to make a statement. Ahead. The Burlington Seahorses were inspired to make jerseys that read hashtag equal pay after watching the U.S. women's national team win the FIFA World Cup championship in 2019. The win started a debate regarding equal pay in sports. The women's team, the winners, were paid much less than their male counterparts. It's still a problem today, and it's a problem everywhere. And so I think it's important that with our movement, hashtag equal pay, we can spread more awareness on that. In the final minutes of one of their games, several team members removed their normal jerseys and revealed the equal pay statement jerseys. And the players were actually given yellow cards for excessive celebration, but it helped to send their message to a much larger audience. Every time I look at my phone, the group chat is like, Anderson Cooper has called, NPR is doing a show. And the team received star-studded shout outs, including a retweet from the U.S. Women's National Team. Some of my absolute idols have retweeted posts about us or, um, you know, contacted us. It's just crazy that they're now, like, recognizing us as inspiring people who are um, taking this movement to the next level. Through the attention, the team received orders for 2,500 jerseys, totaling $50,000 in sales. It's money the team gave to girls use sports programs in their community. And these seahorses are certainly proof of the old saying, teamwork makes the dream work. A team is honestly more powerful than like an individual, and having a team come together and bring this to the school is really powerful. Continuing in the spirit of teamwork, a group of students at the University of Nebraska came together to demand equal treatment, not just in sports, but across campus. In all of my 22 years, this is the most hopeful I've ever felt. And I feel like it's because we're fed up. Taylor Johnson, a track and field star at UNL, feels optimistic. She and other athletes formed the Minority Student Athlete Collective following the activism seen across the country in the summer of 2020. Going through like oppressive situations growing up is definitely something that encouraged me to join this group and also with people who are not afraid to speak against like bad treatment. My teammates, they have a huge part of their life that isn't just on the field and that isn't sport and um, there's, a, there's another big part to them. The athletes wrote a letter to the administration calling for change on all levels, not just within sports. Their list included wanting more people of color serving as head coaches, more education for freshmen regarding racial injustice, and memorials that reflect the diversity of the school's athletes. Notable student athlete Ben Stilley joined the group and spoke at a rally MSAC held about racial injustice. Especially just as a white community, just educating yourselves on um, those topics uh, definitely helps you understand. Women's basketball coach Amy Williams also spoke at that same rally, hoping to be an example for her team. 
I think it's important for them to be able to see me standing up for the things that I believe in um, so that they're also willing to do the same. I have no other choice but to have hope. I have no other choice but to keep on voicing my opinion and keep on fighting for the better treatment of black and brown people in this country. We do want to warn you, this next story includes discussions about sexual abuse and assault. Back in 2016, a culture of abuse within the world of U.S. gymnastics was exposed, leading to the conviction of former team doctor Larry Nasser, who is serving now 40 to 175 years for his abuse of multiple gymnasts. During the trial, several athletes gave powerful victim impact statements like two-time Olympian Allie Raisman. Allie has turned her sexual assault nightmare into advocacy for other victims. I will not rest until every last trace of your influence on this sport has been destroyed like the cancer it is. Allie's strong words against her abuser rang through the courtroom and around the world. Through her experience, she has found the strength to be an advocate and a listener for those who have been through similar trauma. At the mall, or I'm doing an event, at the grocery store, people are sharing their stories with me about being survivors of sexual abuse. Some people share their stories with me for the first time. And so I, I take that responsibility very seriously. Allie was very vocal about the failures of USA Gymnastics to keep gymnasts safe from abuse. And along with fellow Olympian Simone Biles, openly decried a statement with the organization. The gymnast's work has caused a reckoning about athlete safety that has reached well beyond gymnastics. She continues to promote mental health awareness through social media and works with various organizations to promote awareness surrounding sexual assault. We thank you so much for joining us to celebrate some true champions in the world of sports. We hope these stories uplifted you and inspired you along the way. From all of us at Stitch, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.